I'm Natana Sharma, and I am the general counsel at a company called Labelbox. And we actually build tools to support companies to actually build successful machine learning applications. And so what I'd like to start with is if each of my fellow panelists can introduce themselves, they'll tell you a bit about what they do and how they're solving problems with AI today. Absolutely. Happy to get started. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Neeti, and I'm a co-founder, and I lead brand and strategy at Automation Anywhere. We are a leading robotic process automation platform, um, and we enable that with AI technologies in order to create a digital workforce. Um, RPA and AI go hand in hand, and they are a great match because RPA bots, they are able to look at the process as a whole and are privy to a lot of data that across any industry, any vertical, um, any process, really. And so using that data, which is one of the key elements for AI implementation, they're able to then bring a level of intelligence into that process. So whether it's uh, flagging, um, let's say with health data, they're able to flag epidemics a little bit faster, or they're able to um, enable uh, you know, flags where drug interactions uh, based on a patient's history or, for example, they're able to produce 24-hour mortgages or deliver food stamps much faster because they're able to verify data across many, many systems very, very fast, almost instantaneously. So that's kind of what Automation Anywhere does. Thank you, Niti. Sure. Hi, I'm Vasco. I'm co-founder and CEO of Unbabel. Um, and what we do is we combine artificial intelligence with humans uh, to build what we're calling the world's translation layer. And so, um, you know, people have been doing translation for a long time. Uh, you might think, well, how do you actually apply this in the real world? Are you translating websites? And what we found is uh, our initial use case is on customer service. So realistically, what we do is, let's say you take um, customer service agents uh, that are maybe in India or Manila, and by using Babel integrated into the tools that they use, they can now support customers in 28 languages very seamlessly, which means that you're empowering humans to do more than they can do before, because now, instead of just supporting the people that speak the same language as them, they can support you know, pretty much the whole world. But also, from the translator side, uh, they're also now able to do things they couldn't do before. So we have about 130,000 translators in our platform, uh, but we focus on bilinguals, meaning it's not necessarily professional translators, but it's just people that can speak multiple languages, and when aided with AI technology, can produce the level of translation that we need to generate high-quality data, feed our models, and then enable customer service to happen seamlessly. Super cool. OK. Hey, I'm Mike. Uh, my background is uh, I've got a workforce of about 40 million people working full time that pay me $100 a week, which is uh, Fortnite. Uh, so I used to do <laughs> that, uh, made video games. And out of repentance, I'm now trying to save the world through AI uh, to make up for all that lost human productivity. Um, so and it's, it's a lot. If you have teenagers, I apologize. Uh, so I uh, recently founded a company. We're seed stage uh, doing understandable machine learning. Uh, we've kind of built a super cool platform, does supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning all at the same time. But throughout the entire process, it's fully auditable and fully explainable. And wherever we can, it's human understandable. Uh, Spring out of the defense department, where when the red team would beat the good guys in a uh, battle, it doesn't do any good to say, well, you lost again. It's about as useful as playing Alpha Go. Uh, you don't get any better at Go. You just sit there in bewilderment. And so our goal is to build systems that make humans better and close the loop of humans train machines, machines train humans, and we get better and better. Um, for applications, obviously, defense is uh, a space that we work in, but also logistics and uh, healthcare, uh, doing anything we can to uh, facilitate decisions that are really important and are safety critical. My kids are never going to drive a real car like we've been talking about a lot this, this week. Uh, they're four and six. And if there's a wreck, I want to be able to figure out why and fix every car on the fly. And I think that technology already exists. So uh, it's just a matter of getting it out there. Got it. Thanks, Mike. And, and one thing I do want to flag here, you know, I, I said this in the, in the presentation opening the session. Um, it might have been, but it's easy to miss this point about explainability. So deep learning, um, this technique of the nested neural network, that is the cutting edge AI technique used in production today. Um, there's other things going on in research. Um, but when it comes to deep learning, it can actually be very difficult to understand why and how the AI works. So Mike, if you can just say a bit more about 
the explainability piece so that folks start to understand that, that would be great. Sure, okay. Uh, well, I liken deep learning to human learning, where if you ask your three-year-old, why did you draw on the wall? They're just, they have no idea why they actually did it. Humans are uh, really good at post uh, decision making, where they say, I must have bought that car because it was, uh, that Tesla because it was so uh, uh, gas efficient or energy efficient. No, you bought it because it was cool and you wanted to show off to your friends, but you managed to rationalize and convince yourself why. And deep learning is sort of that same thing, where you can start interrogating decision making and try to figure out why did it do that, but most of the systems aren't really human understandable. The, the biggest systems have more uh, uh, decision gates than humans have neurons in their brains or bodies, so uh, it's really hard for us to understand what's going on. And I think even the best attempts to explain deep learning, like Google's What If platform, it's really neat, but you know, we found situations where it's wrong as much as 8% of the time, uh, which is really bad for a calculator. Uh, to be wrong 8% of the time in some situations, right? Um, and now on the other side, I'm an optimist about using un unexplainable machine learning. Uh, put those cars on the road tomorrow. We'll save a million lives and we'll still lose 300K while we improve the technology. If I get a choice between an AI radiologist who can't explain what's going on or a human radiologist, I'll take the AI one. They're better at it and I'm playing the odds game. But when it comes to things like parole decisions, loan decisions, who gets into a venue and who doesn't, and having that be run by an inexplicable AI system trained on biased data, because the humans that trained that system were biased, that scares the hell out of me. Uh, deploying software without a debugger is what we're doing as fast as we can. And uh, man, that's just crazy. If you're software, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Not passionate um, at all about it. <laughs> so I think, you know, the, the AI for Good panel is next, but definitely when it comes to these questions about AI, there are the ethical issues as well, and those are really important for us to always keep in mind. Um, but I think my next question for each of you is, hey, let's say folks in the room are intrigued by what you're doing. What's, what's something that they can do to get started if, if folks are early in their AI journey? So from my angle, if I look at it, um, robotic process automation helps you automate your processes uh, and makes it a little bit more efficient, definitely brings error-free, error reduction into your processes and so forth. Now, enabling that with AI actually lets you take that efficiency and take the data that you've now garnered through those processes and bring it to that next level. What are you going to do with it? You know, How are you going to enable your customers better, your shareholders better, society better? How are you going to bring some human centricity into your service models? How are you going to uh, deliver the next level of products and services that are for humans? And so for me, um, it's, uh, the next step is to look at your processes. Everything that can be automated should be automated so that your human workforce is actually focusing on creating the next level of everything, product, services, human centricity, um, doesn't matter what, what business you're in or what vertical you're in. So my next step, and what I would suggest to the audience, is automate, look at automating everything that can be automated in your organization. It gives you the next competitive edge. It services your customers and your partners and your shareholders better. Definitely works better for society. In fact, I'd say it's not just competitive edge, it's that you're getting blown away by people who are doing that already. Uh, right. New entrants into every marketplace <laughs> that are starting with that kind of a basis. You're just gonna get blown away by them if you don't try to cap up. If you don't up. do it, you will be left behind. And, right. And I'll flag too that there will be mistakes. It's not gonna work perfectly right away, but the earlier, you're gonna find those mistakes by actually doing. So you can talk and talk and talk, but you're not actually gonna refine your processes and build those systems unless you actually start building and doing with this technology. And when you do that, there will be mistakes and there will be embarrassing mistakes, but you'll be able to fix them. And that's gonna take you further and further ahead of competitors. I, I would su suggest actually a different route. Uh, sometimes what I, f what I feel also is because there is a, a misunderstanding of how developed some of the AI technologies are and what they can do, there's also this perception of like AI is gonna fix everything. We're gonna have this data set and we're gonna plan an algorithm, it's gonna be perfect. And actually one of the things that I've noticed is that um, the, the, all of the deep learning uh, technology kind of en enabled more of a democratization of using AI. E and even in the sense of, of, of playing with it. So it used to be that, you 
like you said before, you needed a team of people to describe features. It was a long process. You needed you know, a team of PhDs to be able to deploy an AI algorithm. Nowadays, we have you know, like PhD students that are doing an internship, and just doing that internship, they produce really valuable and viable production-ready results. And so what I invite you is to do one of two things, if you're curious. It's just play around a little bit with it. You know, go to TensorFlow, download some stuff. You're not going to become an expert, but there's a lot of like, interesting examples that give you a better understanding of what it can do and what it can't do, and give you a little bit more sensitivity. And if you're interested a little bit more, go to a place like um, you know, a machine learning summer school. There's one in Lisbon. There's a couple in different places where you can actually have more hands-on. And like I said, it's not like you're going to become a developer afterwards, but it gives you more of that, of that you know, getting in touch with technology that you can do nowadays that you couldn't do before. Yeah, fast.ai, F-A-S-T.ai. Um, they have a really great set of tutorials on machine learning just on their website, available for free. I'm not a fan of TensorFlow at all, but the TensorFlow Playground is really cool. It's an entire game where you try to figure out how to use a neural net, but it will explain to you what's going on there. I couldn't agree more with that notion of democratization of the base needed to be successful, which was printing press, and then anyone can write a book, and then movies, and now any kid with an iPhone camera can make her perfect movie. Video games have done the same thing, so two kids in a garage can now make a really competitive million-dollar video game, and I hope this is the same way where everyone can access it. I think uh, we have unanimous oh. agreement there because even RPA is <laughs> one of the fastest growing technologies, right? And it is because it is the democratization of automation. Mm -hmm. And it has to be that accessible for every human to take. And that is key to everything. So I totally agree with all three of you, yeah. All right, well, we need to disagree about something. <laughs> I, I think my, my rough answer to you would be uh, skepticism. Bring a lot of skepticism when you're using these systems, just like when you're reading the news. Uh, I was at a multi-billion dollar organization that had gotten a data robot license. Really cool stuff. It takes your data and shoves it into 50 models, and then it says, this one's the best. And they're like, see, great, we got the answer. We're done. And they move on. No concept of why that model is being applied to it no concept of whether it's actually accurate, and they're making big decisions about their population and what to do with them, with a rough notion of what's the most important thing to our entire 25 million person population, let's do more of that. And of yeah. course, people are nuanced. And I would say, uh, you know, along with your skepticism, uh, I, I fully agree with that. I, if you look even at problems that people consider they have been solved, like translation, right? Everybody uses Google Translate. It's great for a consumer application. A lot of great work went into it. And people think, oh, it's done. Like, we solved translation in all sorts. But if you look at, for example, translation in the enterprise, it's very, very far from being solved. Like, you need anything realistically that you require in terms of having trust of communication between humans, and machine translation is not there yet. And yet, we live in this world where we, assi we assume that certain problems have been solved yet, uh, uh, solved already by deploying deep learning, and that creates a false sense of where we are, right? It gives us a sense of like, oh, we've solved a lot of these problems. And it's not that we're far from solving it. It's just that if we're not looking carefully into how they're being deployed, we're also missing out on possible breakthroughs and opportunities to use it in efficient ways. Uh, so it's, I think it's very important to come in with, uh, you know, with clear eyes and saying, yeah, like there's a lot of amazing things we can do, but we're not going to take things for granted. I think ver ver verifiability is an important aspect of, of anything that we do today. Thank you. And on that note, I, I'd love to hear from each of you something that's been really surprising, maybe funny, shocking, um, that you have experienced or discovered on this AI journey. Mm. And we can maybe start with Mike and go back. Sure. Uh, so my background is VR. You want to talk about a winter of, hey, <laughs> do, can I just be in lawnmower, man? It just works, right? And then for 20 years it went away, which is why I slunk my tail over to video games. Um, in the game space, uh, you have to understand what you're doing with players with AI. So, you know, you make a video game and the monsters kill all the players by accident. And you're like, wow, what did it do? So we would build explainable AI systems that would tell you as they're walking around on screen, I'm trying to find the player. I'm I found them. I'm detecting them. Now I've got them. Just a full debuggable AI. We needed that to be able to make an, a good entertainment experience. And then I switched to the real world of AI, and there's not even the vaguest notion of that. It's just so striking to me. It's like, how do you use it without knowing what it's doing? How do you evolve it if you don't know what it's doing? And the answer is, you keep throwing until enough darts hit the middle of the dartboard. That, that shocked me. Um, so, uh, yeah, so obviously I'm just going to fix it. <laughs> we'll <laughs> got see. it. You know, I, I like. Um, there's a lot of, um, e it's easy to think about errors or mistakes that happen, uh, and some of them are funny. I, I tend to focus more on the positive outcomes when I see something that I've been seeing for a long time actually work. And, and for us, one of those aspects has been that we, I've always believed that you could actually, communication is, is, 
is building trust. And part of that is sales. And everybody always says, like, no, you need, if you're selling something, if you're entering a new market, you need, people, you need people in that market that can communicate the local language. And I always thought, well, no, I mean, you should be able, if, if your translation layer is seamless enough, you should be able to have those two people communicate and sell products without having to be physically there in the language of the person you're selling to. And this was just happened last week. For the first time, we've closed a customer where the entire negotiation happened using Babel as our own dog fooding. And, and it was really cool because it also showed the customer that, hey, like, if they can sell me this and they can communicate in this way, then this is the kind of quality that I'm getting. And so for me, it was really surprising that something that, you know, from the beginning I thought it would be easy took so long to get to a point where it actually really works in the real world with real people and nuance in communication, kind of everything else that goes into there. Can you teach me how to communicate with my wife? <laughs> I can do my best. <laughs> Hard work. Yeah. <laughs> um, for me, the surprising thing was, uh, it, you know, people in the technology field, and we deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis, and we are comfortable with a certain level of progress, a little faster than like regular folk, you know, who are working in different industries across the world. And recently, we did a research um, a paper, uh, you know, interviewed a thousand people across the world, and we were trying to figure out, you know, do they actually understand these intelligence technologies, and what do they feel about it? Are they scared about it? And 72% said they didn't, they were not scared for it. They were not scared about losing their jobs, or they were not scared about what it would do to human. And that, to me, was a little bit surprising, because on the ground, across every industry, non-technologists um, were very open to the idea. They could see the benefits. They could see the difference it would make to their jobs. And um, that was uh, very inspiring, as well as uh, surprising for me. Got it. And I'll share one, one thing that I found to be really surprising is how early we are. Um, you know, the, the slides that I shared around the computational power and the cost of computation, the exponentials there, how fast that's moving, it means that what's possible now was just not possible two years ago or even 18 months ago. So that doubling every three to five months of the computational power that you can apply to an AI algorithm, what that means on the ground is that companies now can actually engage in successful AI experiments that were not possible a year and a half or two years ago. And so for me, that's surprising because, you know, being in the, I, I, um, I had the benefit of, of going to Singularity University summer program in the summer of 2012. I, we've been thinking about these things deeply for a long time, but I, I love what you said, Mike, about that 20 year t time we've been waiting for VR. I think with AI, we've been waiting and waiting and it feels, it really feels to me like there's a way in which the time is now um, in a way that's exciting, surprising, a little, a little scary for me, technologist. It's mind-boggling because six months from now, everything we wish could be done is going to have been done by someone else while we're still trying to deploy our own system. <laughs> uh, it's cool, but boy, oof. Yeah. Well, um, I'd love to open this up to audience participation. Um, do we have a mic runner? Um, so if, if, if we've got mic runners, there. that's great. And if you um, can raise your hand, if you've got a question for the panel, that would be great. You're standing. You've got a question. Go for it. With regard to the topic of AI and bias, um, it goes without saying that if you imply that there's bias in something, there must be some sort of universal norm that you're biased against. If I define the system to be unbiased, say, here in San Francisco, it's probably likely it would be seen as biased some other part of the world, vice versa. This suggests there's almost sort of a universal norm that we're trying to aspire to. Got it. So this is this is a question asking us about about bias and how do we how do we really we humans are biased. So what does it mean to try to create algorithms that are unbiased? So I'll say something and then um, give the folks on the panel a chance to respond as well. I think um, our our algor algorithms are a reflection of us. So when we humans are training our algorithms, they're going to be affected by what we teach them. And so, for example, we know that Amazon's facial recognition is worse at recognizing women and substantially worse at recognizing dark-skinned women than white men. And that's a problem when, for example, the algorithm might be deployed 
on a street, if a self-driving car is more likely to hit certain people than others, that's something we want to fix. Um, and we can do that by understand, running tests, understanding the bias, and then choosing to teach the algorithm additional data that will help to correct that bias. Well, let me just disagree, disagree slightly. You're assuming that that's not what you want. I don't care what it is. You know, <laughs> ideally, that's well, with, the case, with right? With people on the street, I'm pretty hopeful that's not what we want. Right, but my point is, like, to me, it doesn't matter. There's no notion of right or wrong. It's just what were you trying to do with this piece of software, and does it actually do it? And that's sort of the job of the C++ compiler, not the idea of, yes, well, if you have something that's gender disparate, that's a problem. That's not what the C++ compiler does, and I don't think that's what machine learning should do either, you should just surface those issues and then let a society decide whether you're allowed to have naked people in advertisements or not, because that's a very social decision. Well, I think that um, one key piece is that we can learn um, what is this algorithm likely to do and we can make decisions. Do we want, how do we want to train it? Mm -hmm. um, Niti and Vasco, do you want to add? So from my point, I think one of the ways to deal or reduce bias is to have more data. The fact that a human cannot process as much data, let's say medical data, across every hospital in the world at the same time to come back and say there's a bias in diagnosis across a certain segment of audience. Um, but a robot can. So a bot or machines or software can basically look at a way bigger chunk of data than humans ever can as a whole. That should help reduce bias. The fact that you have more data across the world, data that can be collated from different parts, helps reduce that bias. So to some extent, it's a journey. It's not going to be fast. But the more data we have, the more data that bots have, the more data is unbiased. I mean, I think that solves one kind of bias. And the other type is, in North Carolina, if you take 100 years of residential loan data, guess what? There's a huge amount of racial bias, and it reduces over time. You don't want to capture more data. You want to see why decisions are being made. Is it proxy, zip code for race, that sort of thing? Is that what's the factor that's actually making this model make a dis differentiable decision? Agreed. So it's, it's one kind of bias, and the other, I totally agree. It's right. more faces. But the fact that you can look at mortgage data now across the entire of the US and then that helps reduce the bias. Sure, sure. So you can make it non-geo specific, non-segment specific, and that helps. So yep. to some extent, again, more data and even more and global and continental and uh, world data will basically help reduce that bias. That's a darn good point. You compare the two and then start asking questions, right? Why would the US one give a different answer than the North Carolina one? Yep. I'm from I North Carolina, by the way. I'm not uh, just bagging North Carolina. It's South Carolina you want to worry about. <laughs> I, I also pre appreciate our panelists' attempts to disagree. <laughs> I'm trying really hard. <laughs> so thank you. No, I was going to say that actually, I don't think you're going to be able to eliminate, eliminate biases completely of, of, of algorithms. Like, you're going to do a better job, but you know, if every human, we all have biases uh, you know, across a bunch of different things. And the best we can do right now is to hope to create AI that is as good as humans in making some decisions. And I, I think a lot of our decisions and biases come from you know, so many different factors, inherent moral um, opinions about how things should happen and how should society behave, et cetera. And at worst case, or, or at the limit, those will still be included. And it will be very hard to get, get rid of it because we don't even know how to get rid of ours, right? I mean, we can get better, and there's some that are more obvious in terms of discrimination in different sorts, but there's way more biases beyond that that have to do with what's good, what's evil, and what are the kind of things we want to, you know, prioritize over others. Um, yeah, I don't think we're going to create a godlike algorithm anytime soon. Thank you. So, next question. Hello. Hello. It's working. Hi, I'm Ariel Lipschutz. I'm from Argentina. I have been working on artificial intelligence for the last three years. And let me tell you the truth I'm a little bit scared about what's going to happen because nowadays I can create my own model and I can build a software that detects a cat, a good or a bad tomato, or detect a cancers, you know? But when the super artificial intelligence is going to be available. I don't know what the computer is going to create. There is going to be a software that will create their own model, and we will have no idea about what is going on inside. And that's, that's going to set if, if, if you have cancer or no, but we are not going to know why and how that software will, will set that. And and, and I think that we, we should be working about some ethical framework or something like that 
to, to understand what's going on on that edge. And I want to ask you about what do you think about that? What, what do you think about that framework or how are we going to deal with that uh, mother? Thank you so much. Got it. So the, the question now really is, when it comes to these later stages of AI, especially the stage where AI is creating its own intelligence that's even smarter than it, and it gets far beyond our human understanding, um, how do we keep it safe? So I've got some thoughts, but I'll go last this time. Um, Vasco, you want to start? Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I actually am a big believer, or I'm more of a believer on the hybrid human AI model. And I think that before we get to, or even when we do get to super intelligence, there's going to be a human component embedded there. So I think you're going to see a, a merge between AI and human brains. We're seeing that through BCIs nowadays uh, starting in that path. I mean, all of us already depend on AI on a daily basis. How many of you remember phone numbers anymore? You know, like we're yeah. offloading a lot of our brain into machines already. It's just happening at a slow pace. It's going to happen faster. And so I think when it gets to that, the, the question is more, we if we have the computational power, what do we direct that computational power towards? And, and those decisions of what do we want to solve and what are the, the, the solutions we want to create, I think we'll have still uh, some form of human interaction there. And so you won't be completely, hey, it's going to go on its own and decide its own things. Is It's going to be, in a way, a, a, a merge of human and machine that's going to help guide where do we apply computational resources to. I'm trying to disagree, but I really can. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I agree. Will. I think uh, it might be a little bit of a naive viewpoint, but humans are exceptional. And I think if you have a human and a uh, machine working together, uh, the checks and balances can be put in place. Yes, we require uh, you know, consciousness to do that, and we require a dedicated effort to do that. But uh, I think the future is uh, very optimistically uh, great, and that is a human and bot or a human and machine combination that will get us to the next level of evolution. Oh, man, I wish that were true. Uh, uh, so all three of my cats got together and tried to put together an ethical framework for me. And uh, uh, you know, I didn't pay attention to it at all. Uh, uh, so I think, I think, uh, I think the, the outcome we're hoping for is that we're the pet monkeys uh, who are the progenitors of that AI system. Uh, but the cool thing is you guys don't have to worry about global warming at all because uh, that's going to come way before that's an issue. So yeah, I'm on, I'm on the dark side of this. I love all the optimism that I'm trying to absorb here. That's why I'm working on it. But man, are we stupid with technology we don't understand. You know, we feed radiation, uh, radioactive materials to people for uh, virility drugs before we realize what they are. Right? We just do stupid, stupid things with tech. And the tech that's required to make a functional brain-computer interface where you're actually in, intertwined with the cloud, I think, will necessarily have to come after the tech that that's able to be able to think as well as a human brain, and I don't think we're able to control it at that point due to its exponential I disagree growth. with that. One, Maybe, are, are I hope so. Are you saying that I hope you're right. You were created by your cats, though. Huh? Are you saying you were created by your cats? No, though? not at all. I'm just saying that that's, 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 gonna, a, that's, a, that's that a key part, difference. That's a key gonna, difference. I'm going to disagree oh. with all of you. Oh, man. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> finally, finally. first. <laughs> I know, I know. I was, that's why I had to go last. I was like, I get to disagree with everyone. No. So I think this is a real problem and that there are um, AI researchers who are working on this problem. So at OpenAI, um, which is uh, actually just recently got a billion dollar investment from Microsoft, OpenAI here in San Francisco is working on building general AI. Um, they have a whole team of researchers that are focused on developing safe AI because they are very worried about what happens if we build general AI that doesn't care about humans? Or what happens if we build general AI where we don't build in safeguards that we don't understand ahead of time. So when, when all the people get killed in a, in a video game by the AI in the game, you can restart. But if we created an AI in the world and set it a task and it was out in the physical world, we, couldn't, we can't just restart, restart our physical world. So folks are worried about this. Another group that's working on this is the Mach Machine Intelligence Research Institute. And so the Machine Intelligence Research Institute comes out with papers. Um, it's a nonprofit that really works on this question of AI safety. Um, it's a very hard problem. And the question is, can we create some progress in the mathematics of AI safety before we get to general AI? So um, let me see. Are there any other questions? I think we have time for one more. OK, so my question is about uh, adversarial learning. 
Um, there have been instances, many of them, where humans have been able to fool algorithms with subtle changes, for example, in the background when you're trying to recognize faces. Um, so it seems like this, there are serious limitations with uh, deep learning. Uh, you might want to throw more data at it, uh, but then the neural network becomes more complex and diminishing returns set in. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm at a loss to understand why people think that uh, AI is going to be more intelligent than humans. Uh, if humans can fool uh, algorithms so easily, where is this, what is the source of this confidence in algorithms? I would say lack of understanding. Uh, in a way, I, I think the different the gap there is that people assume that the current technology, so that we already are at the point that we've created the algorithms that are sufficient to do a general artificial intelligence, and we haven't. Deep learning is limited. I mean, if you think about the amount of data that a human child is exposed to to learn something versus the, the amount of data that you can feed nowadays to a deep learning algorithm, it's like. Order, like we require orders of magnitude less data than what we can feed to a deep learning algorithm, and we can learn much more. So clearly, there's a difference in the underlying algorithms and our ability to understand. And I, I think that's, that's one uh, key aspect, is that we believe that that's going to happen soon, but there are breakthroughs that haven't happened yet that need to happen for us to be able to get there. Uh, and part of that is really uh, uh, the, on the understanding of how do we actually do it. I mean, we don't really know how human intelligence and human consciousness arises, which is one of the big issues. Deep learning gives us uh, narrow AI and, and, and uh, the ability to work on specific problems, but the gap from that to general artificial intelligence, there's breakthroughs that need to happen, and we don't know when or what are those breakthroughs, obviously. Yeah, I mean, in the sort of defense and crypto spaces and others, most of the deep learning techniques are the least resilient to adversarial attacks or poisoning. That's why they're not used for certain systems, because it's so easy for somebody just like human brains to sneak in a little bit of data and you don't realize you saw that ad on Facebook and get slowly, subtly moved in a different direction. You can do the same thing with a number of deep learning techniques, and I agree, it's just a shortcoming of the current tech. There's other ways to approach ML if what you care about is uh, that sort of safety against adversarial attack. Nidhi, do you have anything to add? I don't have anything to add there. So, so one, other, one other thing that I, I'll say is, um, and Vaxco, I think you said this very well, I think it, it really is remembering that we're now just at software 2.0 or narrow AI. And to get to general AI, none of us know how to do it yet. Um, and even OpenAI that is working on this with some of the best um, AI machine learning PhDs in the world, um, they don't know how to do it either. So that's a very active area of research. And when we do break through and get to general AI, it will likely look very different from weak AI. So just as weak AI or um, the, the software 2.0 looks very different from software 1.0, the next stages are likely to look very different from what we have now. Yeah, Hinton himself said that it's a dead end evolutionarily, right? The neural net. So that's the, the developer of, of deep learning, um, Jeff Hinton over at the University of Toronto. So Canada has actually got incredible um, AI. So for those Canadians in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for, for taking the time to, to listen to us. Um, I think that's it for, for our panel. Super fun. And, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll let our panelists go off the stage and then I'll, I'll follow you all because I'm going to do the introduction for the next one. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Well done.